one of the things that we're finding out as uh, new parents, everything takes longer. Everything. <laughs> you have that nice plan for having breakfast in the morning, and, uh, and well, sometimes your, your kids, they just take way longer. <laughs> And we feel so bad for you. Oh, no. No, no. I'm not complaining. Please don't take that as complaining. I love every bit of it. It's pretty much the best. Get used to it. Yeah. You've been trying to get around earlier and earlier. It just does not work out. <laughs> this is okay, this is not too. Advent, uh, the word comes, the, the word ha, from the Latin word adventius, means arrival. Uh, it is the designated period prior to Christmas Day. Um, it is the time to ponder the great sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, made for us by coming to earth as an infant. He lived a perfect life, died a sacrificial death, and rose from the dead for us. He saved us from our sins. <clears throat> and eternal damnation because of his great love. And he adopts each person individually into his family through the repentance and faith in him. The first candle of the Advent season is the candle of expectation and hope. Uh, for the Jews, it was the hope of the coming King and Messiah that God had promised them. Today, we let this candle remind us of the great hope that we have in Christ the Messiah and in God's promises. <clears throat> Jeremiah 33, 14 through 16. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the gracious promise I made to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and in that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord, our righteousness. The second candle that we are lighting today is called the Candle of Preparation of Peace. This is from Isaiah 40, 3 through 5. In the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, and every mountain, shall be, every mountain and hill shall be made low. The rough ground shall become level, and the rugged places a plain. At the glory of the, and, at the, glory of the Lord... Oh, that's supposed to be and... And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all the people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Right. <laughs> uh, let it remind us to prepare our hearts for the coming of Christ. Let us pray. Father, during this Advent season, may we be reminded of your promise to us and your fulfillment and your fulfillment of them. Help us prepare our lives for his advent within us. Reveal to us any sin which would separate us from the relationship with you. We know that in the greatness of your love, you have promised to forgive us and cleanse us of all wrong. May we prepare our lives for the coming of Jesus, who will once again appear to receive us unto himself. We ask this in his precious name. Amen. Thank you. Thanks, Sean and Corey and Elspeth. Elspeth spent a little time in my office this morning. <clears throat> she looked at me. My little heart melted. <laughs> uh, a couple of announcements as we get started. Uh, December is a busy month. Uh, in, in the church calendar, there are several things going on. 
Um, so please pay attention to the calendar. Uh, I have people for that. I have two ladies that manage my schedule and make sure I get where I'm supposed to be when I'm supposed to be there. So that's a, if you don't have people to help you, you should get some. They're awesome. <laughs> um, next week uh, is caroling on the 10th. It is after church. So there'll be church and there'll be Sloppy Joes uh, made by Joe Dekarski, right? So if you haven't had Joe Dekarski, Sloppy Joes. Oh, so yes. good. Uh, there's still a need for 16 dozen cookies. Please see Deb Hartman. There's also a need for socks. Uh, Prime Timers Christmas party if you're 50 or older. Now I want you to know I'm I'm attending the Prime Timers Christmas party as a guest. <laughs> I am not yet sufficiently aged to join the Prime Timers. <laughs> officially, officially. Me neither. Yeah. I'll get there eventually, but not just yet. Um, and then also there's a there's a couple different things there. Uh, okay, I've also been told very specifically about the angel tree. There are tags on the angel tree, so go take one uh, or take more if you are so inclined. Uh, buy the gift that is on the tag. Wrap it or don't wrap it as you desire. Make sure you put the tag on the outside and then bring that gift back to the office or back to the tree. The deadline is the 19th. Now, if you're thinking that sounds like a lot of work, I just would rather give money and not do any work. There's a place for that. Uh, so just take some money to Melissa and she will make all that happen for you. Um, and then, oh, she's not here. I was going to ask her if that was all. Is that everything for the angel tree back there? No? Are we good? Yes. Sean says, sure. <laughs> Corey says, yes. Corey says, yes. Okay, good. Got it. And then also, uh, next week, I'm, we're going to do an NCD survey. It's a natural church development survey. It's basically uh, asking you a series of questions to give feedback about how we're doing as a church. So it's completely anonymous. You just, it's just a metric that we're going to use to, to uh, prepare for the coming year. Uh, 2018 is going to be very exciting. We're already in the process of setting some goals and sort of defining what it looks like to do well as a church. Um, so that's going to be next week. And then the last announcement I have, Emily, would you come up here and join me? Ladies and gentlemen, this young lady is something special. Yeah. Over the past, you know, several months, we've had uh, sort of a shortage of nursery volunteers. And so there have been several appeals, hey, we need more volunteers, we need more volunteers, and, you know, so maybe you're volunteered out, and that's okay. So we hired somebody. This is Emily Marshall. She's a college student over at New Tribes. Uh, she's going to be our nursery coordinator. She's going to be a permanent presence. Uh, when she's not away from school, she'll be here every week. So that way we have one person who's always there, who can make the phone calls to the volunteers, who can pester uh, those of you who do volunteer. And uh, so this is Emily. So if you get a phone call from Emily, she is acting on our behalf uh, in order to help keep the nursery staff. There aren't any kids today, so... She gets a... You're, you're fired, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Interesting uh, tidbit about her mother and me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't, oh, you need to share it. Just okay. What she says. <laughs> <laughs> happy wife, happy Wiser wife. Form. Happy wife, happy wife. Thank you, Mark, for the reminder. No uh, Ruth Ann taught Emily's mother English when she was in high school. In wow. In Virginia. So it was like a very she natural connection. She, oh, yeah, she can join the prime time. Wow. So, yeah, folks, just, uh, you know, make Emily feel welcome as a part of our community here. She's going to be doing a lot of good work for us. And we're so thankful for her. Thank uh, join me, if you would, please, in John chapter 12. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and Romans. We're, uh, we're finishing up the first half of John, or we're going to finish next week the first half of the Gospel of John, and then we'll do some Christmas stuff. We'll come back in the new year talking about the church for a couple of weeks, and um, then we're going to get back into the second half of John. The second half of John really focuses in on the crucifixion, and if the Lord wills, we'll end by Easter. If the Lord doesn't will, who are we to complain about when the Lord decides when to end the sermon series, right? You can complain to me, I guess. <laughs> <clears throat> I, um, I have two sons, and I, my sons are delightful to me. Boys in general are delightful to me. They're much easier than girls. I would say that even if my daughters were here, my daughters would agree. 
Girls are difficult growing up. Boys are difficult in a different way. And one of the ways that boys are different is um, just how they engage the world around them. Our house up in Lansing, outside Lansing, sits on an acre of grass surrounded by acres of farmland. So a, a typical day or a typical weekend would be spending the day doing chores around the house and then having a bonfire in the evening. It was a paradise for little boys. We had mini bikes and dogs and trampolines. The house was a constant flurry of friends and activities. And little boys don't realize that they stink. <laughs> they don't. I don't know what it is about the olfactory senses, but they don't develop in little boys right off the bat. And so after a full day of, you know, cut grass, wet dog, mini bikes, gasoline, all those kind of things, um, the leftover sticky marshmallow smell, at the end of the day, a tired little boy doesn't need a bath, right? <laughs> at least according to him. I'm not dirty, Mom. I was in the pool today. But young men become suddenly aware of body odor. For my boys, it was around age 12 when they started to realize that they smelled a little funky and they wanted desperately to be rid of it. <clears throat> my older son came to me one time in the store, and I was in school, so money was a little bit tight. He came to me, and he had two cans of deodorant. And he said, Dad, I need, I need both of these. And I said, no. And he said, Dad, you don't understand. You don't understand. This one is so that I don't smell bad, and this one is so that I smell good. <laughs> and so I responded to him in a way that he probably holds against me even to this day. I said, no, son. You don't understand. You have a choice to make before you. You can either not smell bad or you can smell good. You can't do both. <laughs> or you can get a job. <laughs> I saw him yesterday. He reminded me that his, uh, his attitude towards work needs improvement. <laughs> because it costs money to smell good. I mean, I didn't, I didn't smell all of you as you walked into the building, but I imagine you've showered within the last couple days, right? <coughs> Some of you are not nodding enthusiastically. We'll just let it slide. Okay? But, yeah. You, you know, uh, one of the things about being on the road is I didn't get to shower every day. Okay? And so you learn to uh, do the Marine Corps shower, which is just kind of a spray all over. And, you know, you, you have that, that, delightful, uh, that delightful odor of um, cologne following your room. It costs money to smell good. And that's as true in the ancient world as it is today. In the ancient world, people didn't bathe as often as we do. Indoor plumbing was very rare, and people would often use public baths occasionally. Every now and then, you would go to the bath. This varied by social class. The upper classes could bathe more often, but usually they would apply perfume to mask unpleasant odors. Many of the perfumes were difficult to get and very expensive. The rich and the royal smelled good, and everybody else just smelled like hard work outside. Smelled like little boys after a hard day play. Because you didn't wash your clothes every day either. We live in a time of incredible luxury where you can put your clothing in the machine, and the machine washes it for you, the machine dry, it does everything but fold it, right? And put it away. And put it away. <clears throat> and we have all these smells. We have soaps, and we have uh, deodorant. I deodorized this morning, and you're welcome, you know? Um, <laughs> Everybody else smelled bad in the ancient world. We live in a time of incredible luxury. Well, Mary, Lazarus' sister, has a stash of really good perfume from far away. And she uses all of it to honor Jesus, the King. This section of John is the conclusion of Jesus' public ministry. The upcoming Passover feast will be Jesus' last one. His hour has come. Take a look with me, if you would please, at John chapter 12. Because Jesus is going to receive anointing and enter Jerusalem as a king. And ironically, he will be enthroned, not on a throne, but on a cross. Honor the king. Verse 1 says this, Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Beth Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. 
But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected, Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. So it's six days before the Passover. And people are beginning to congregate around the ancient city of Jerusalem. See, this is one of those required feasts. And people would make a pilgrimage from far away. And so you would have to sort of gauge, okay, when are we going to get there? Well, just like you, when you make a trip, how, how long does it take to get from here to Texas? Anybody know? About 18 hours. About 18 hours. So when are you going to leave? Are you going to drive straight through? Are you going to drive through the night? How are you going to do it? And are you going to add a buffer? This is one of the things when I was on the road. <clears throat> and you're dealing with a dispatcher. Now, a dispatcher sits in an office and looks at where you are on a computer. And they say, oh, you're, you're about two hours away from that location, aren't you? No, I'm about two and a half hours away from that location. At least, maybe three. No, 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 I can see right now. I can see exactly where you're at. Yeah, and I can see exactly where I'm at. And I can see the traffic that you can't see. <laughs> and the hills, and all of those things. So when you're planning a trip, you have to make a plan that accommodates, you know, delays. The ancient world is no different except you're walking. So if you're walking 100 miles to get somewhere, you have to factor in how many days is it going to take. What happens if it's bad weather? Are we going to walk in the rain? I can tell you Her Majesty is not going to walk in the rain. <laughs> As the Jews congregate in the city, they were going to come early, uh, partly to make sure they got there on time, and then another part is to make sure that they are ritually pure. You see, if they're going to participate in the religious festivals in Judaism, they're going to have to handle any outstanding sin issues. So if they come into contact with a corpse, there's a washing ceremony that they have to do. If there's something that's unresolved in their religious life, there's an offering that they'll have to make, and it's going to be crowded. And so they're going to have to come early. So six days before Passover... People are coming and congregating. And Bethany is only two miles from Jerusalem. So it's a convenient place. It's a good place to stop. And you could probably find a place to stay. So Jesus comes to Bethany six days before the Passover. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus are hosting a dinner in Jesus' honor. And I would imagine that every dinner held in that household after Lazarus has been raised from the dead was in Jesus' honor. Can you imagine that? <clears throat> shoes or sandals were taken off in the house and feet were washed by a servant or slave feet were considered gross so the job usually fell to the lowest class person in the household Lazarus is probably the head of the household along with his unmarried sisters he has Lazarus has the highest social setting in the, in the household he is the householder it's his house what he says goes and right under him, his unmarried sisters are sort of the co-mistresses of the house. And I know some of you ladies are the mistress of your own homes. And I know, just like my wife, what she says goes, right? I'm a smart husband, folks, okay? And on Friday, I told my wife, I said, hey, I need to go to the office for a little while on Saturday morning. But when I get home, I'm going to clean the house. And she melted. <laughs> she's the mistress of the household Mary and Martha are the mistresses of the household they direct the affairs of the house as Jesus sits at the table with his disciples and Lazarus Mary comes in to anoint his feet with precious perfume anointing was usually done on the head not the feet because feet are the dirtiest part of your body. When you wear sandals and walk on dirty roads, your feet get gross. And so Mary, who is the co-mistress of the household, comes in to wash Jesus' feet. That's not her job. 
That's not her place. She steps out of her high, honored place in the household down to the lowest possible position to wash Jesus' feet. In a society, uh, yeah, in a society where a pious rabbi would not even speak to a woman, touch between non-family members of the opposite sex was socially questionable. So Mary's willingness to publicly touch Jesus was shocking. Can you imagine that? Okay, here's a situation where they, they wouldn't even really be talking to each other, and yet they're friends. And so she comes in to wash his feet. She's going to touch his feet. I love all of you. I have to think twice before I touch any of your feet. That would be a good reason. Now I know I'm supposed to be a humble servant, and if you really need your feet washed, I'll help you find somebody. <laughs> Mary, who is the co-mistress of the home, places herself in the status of a slave to anoint Jesus' feet with an extravagant gift of expensive perfume. This honors Jesus. It honors the king. Well, what she uses is a substance called nard, and this refers to spikenard, a fragrant oil from the root of the nard plant in the mountains, from the mountains of northern India. In the Mediterranean world, nard remains the fair of the well-to-do. This plant, and I, I did a little research on this plant, it grows in the Himalaya mountains, you know, where the Sasquatches are, right? And it's from, Sasquatches aren't real, okay? Just, if you disagree with me, we'll talk about it. But it also grows at an elevation of 10,000 to about 16,000 feet. So you have to climb the hill to go dig up the roots. Now, I, it's probably cold up there, isn't it? It's the Himalayas. So you have to go find the plant, you have to dig the plant up, and then you have to carry it back down the hill in order to crush up the roots and get the oil out of them. And then it has to be transported from like Nepal, China, India, all the way over to Bethany outside Jerusalem. Can you imagine how expensive that would be? Can you imagine how much work went into it? How many taxes people levied on that on the way? Oh, you're bringing in some nard. Great. Thank you for doing that. The taxes this much. And so by the time it gets to its final destination, it's been taxed half to death, and it's going to cost you a whole year's pay to get it. What do you, I, I was trying to think, what do I even have that costs a whole year's pay that isn't my house? I came up short. I couldn't think of anything. This perfume could have been her inheritance and the most prized possession that she owned. This is therefore, uh, Ed Klink says this, this is therefore a ridiculously lavish amount of such fine perfume to be used all at once, and especially when applied to only one person. You see, Mary had this. Maybe it was given to her by her mother. Maybe it was something that she was saving for when she got married. She was going to use this drop by drop for the rest of her life. And she says, Jesus is the king. And this is the anointing I want to give. I want to give him everything. And she anoints his feet with about 12 ounces of this precious oil. And then she wipes the nard from his feet with her hair. First of all, she's not supposed to touch him. Okay? As an unmarried woman, it's okay for her to have her hair unbound, but then to take her precious prized hair and to use that as a towel. I mean, folks, they had towels in this household, but to use her hair was to be just the absolute act of submission and love towards Jesus. His feet are too precious to be touched by anything less than her most prized possessions. To use her prized feminine hair to wipe Jesus' feet when normally only servants even touch the Master's feet indicates the depth of her humble submission to and affection for Jesus. Mary's anointing of Jesus is the supreme act of intelligent faith. She has come to fully understand who Jesus is, and her devotion to him is absolute. Everything that she has, everything that she is, from her position in the household to her most prized possession, is placed at Jesus' disposal. Jesus didn't ask her for it. She gave it. The ultimate symbolic expression of service before the cross, this is uh, Craig Keener. The ultimate symbolic expression of service before the cross is Jesus is washing his disciples' feet. The one disciple to carry this act out in, in this gospel, even in advance of Jesus, is emphatically Mary. Mary is a hero of the faith. 
because she sees Jesus as the king and she worships and serves him in preparation for his burial. Throughout the gospel, we've encountered this question repeatedly. Who is Jesus? You see, some people think, oh, he's a nice guy, but he's not very demanding. That's, that's all right. He's nice. I like Jesus. Other people see him and they're, oh, he's a prophet. Yeah, he's going to tell me how to live my life so that I can live a better life. But they don't really fully understand Jesus. You see, Mary fully understands. Mary gets it. We've been asking, who is Jesus? But we ask this other question, who is Jesus to Mary? Jesus' followers often believe in him and progressively understand his identity. This isn't Mary's first time, and she honors him by giving up something precious. She values him over everything. Who is Jesus to Mary? Perhaps this is when she realizes that he is Lord, that he is God, and that he is King. And then the question for us is, who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? Is he going to tell you how to live a better life? That's only part of who he is. Is he a nice guy? I'm sure he's a nice guy. But that's only a part of who he is. He is Lord. He is God. He is King. And everything that you are and everything that you have is to be laid before him at his disposal. Even if it's something precious. You see, Mary is the model of devoted worship of Jesus Christ. Her position in the household, her possessions, even her hair are given in the worship and service of Jesus. Mary represents the devotion of a true disciple. Jesus is more precious than anything she owns. As she anoints his feet and wipes them with her hair, she demonstrates his exalted status. She anoints him as a king. You see, Mary has seen the light of Jesus' identity, and she demonstrates that devotion. But there are still those people who uh, are in the darkness, right? The darkness never really uh, gets too far out of the scene. So we have this picture of Mary giving Jesus this incredible gift, this incredible act of devotion. And at the same time, there's Judas Iscariot. We know he's a bad guy. He's sitting over there thinking, oh, that was a lot of money. Uh, all my finance friends are like, yeah, that was a lot of money. That was a lot. Oh, that might have been too much. Don't give too much. Judas. He's a thief. You see, all of this is foreshadowing the opposition to Jesus in verses 4 to 11. Judas the thief objects because of the poor, when really what he's concerned about is poor Judas. Well, I could have skimmed off a whole lot of money there. Judas is a bad guy, and he's going to act like a bad guy. And then Jesus replies, and this is also foreshadowing hinting at what's to come, I will not always be with you. Looking forward to the crucifixion. You see, his hour has come. And the next half of John's Gospel is going to deal with the path to the cross. Well, what's happening at the time is that people are coming to see Lazarus. They're coming to talk to Jesus at this Passover celebration. And they're believing in him. But there's still the hints of the opposition. There's still the foreshadowing of the cross that is to come. Romano Gardini says this, Here it is again, the stumbling block, scandal, that so often reigned instead of love. No matter what Jesus said, though he uttered words of divine power and profundity, invariably they were answered with stubbornness, distrust, and hate. No matter what he did, heal, help, pardon, shower with gifts, his thanks were hardness of heart, misinterpretation of his motives, blasphemy against the Spirit. You see, even as the smell of Mary's gift fills the house, there are ominous signs of trouble. Jesus has received a royal anointing and now he moves to enter Jerusalem as a king, but instead of a throne, he will be lifted up to the cross. Look, if you would, please, at verse 12. <clears throat> the next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him, and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, 
This is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Honor the king. Honor the king as Jesus arrives in Jerusalem. Well, Passover looks back to the time when Israel escaped from Egypt by the power of God under the leadership of Moses. The Jewish people in the first century resent Roman occupation. And what they want more than anything else is to get rid of Rome and set up an independent kingdom. <clears throat> the next day is five days before the Passover. This celebration of Jewish nationalism. And Jesus comes into Jerusalem from Bethany. And his followers are running on before him, generating a spontaneous crowd. It's like a flash mob, right? There, there's a flash mob of people. And they're shouting, Hosanna. It's almost like uh, they're waving palm branches which is almost like the 4th of July, right? What happens on the 4th of July? We celebrate our independence from Great Britain. Britain. Yeah. Okay, suppose the British came over and said, or you're talking to a British guy, right? And he says, well, on the 4th of July, right? Oh, the Queen is much better than having a president. This is from a movie. <clears throat> oh, it's much better to have a Queen than a president. Really, on the 4th of July, you're going to come over here to our country and say that? If I could whistle, it'd be that, that western whistle. Yeah, I can't do it, sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Waving flags on the 4th of July, waving these palm branches. You see, palm branches are symbols of Jewish nationalism. They were used on coins to represent Israel, an independent state of Israel. So as Jesus is walking in, people are waving these palm branches. Yes! Finally, we're going to get rid of Rome. And they're shouting Hosanna, which comes from Psalm 118.25, which says, uh, the Hebrew is this, Ana Adonai Hoshia Na, which the NIV translates as, Lord, save us. Let's get these Romans out of here. Look, I'm going to wave this palm branch because I'm going to secretly one of the soldiers. And if you want to fight Rome, I'm going to fight them with you. So there's this huge political expectation. Messiah, come and save us from the Romans. But Jesus is not coming as a political king over a single nation. He's coming as a spiritual king whose rule goes beyond national boundaries. You see, you and I are followers of Jesus, the king, even now. And he enters the city riding on a donkey. Now, kings rode donkeys during peacetime. <laughs> Jesus isn't coming as a conquering political king. That would be a war horse surrounded by an army. I know, I'm, I'm just a huge fan of Shrek. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of Shrek and I needed to break the tension. Kings rode on donkeys. He, and there's an intentional allusion here to Zechariah 9 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The donkey stands out in this text as a deliberate rejection of this symbol of arrogant trust in human might, that is, instruments of war. You see, Jesus didn't come surrounded by an army riding a war horse. He came riding a donkey. And his victory is not going to be a political, military victory. It's going to be a spiritual victory achieved by ascending to the throne, and the throne is the cross. His entry into Jerusalem seems to be both an act of self-revelation and a provocation. Jesus is symbolically announcing his messianic claim and challenging Israel's leaders to respond. His identification with Zechariah 9.9 also tells us something about his messianic <coughs> consciousness. Jesus does not enter the city riding a war horse ready for battle against the Romans, but rather as the humble, peace-bringing king. He will bring salvation not through physical conquest, but through self-sacrificial service. And just let's do this too. And the result of all this, just take a peek at verse 20. Verse 20 is going to be next week, but <clears throat> now there were some who were Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. They're Greeks. The whole world is beginning to follow Jesus. And so you can just imagine, what is the effect of all of this popularity on the Jewish leadership? Because what's going to happen to them if everybody follows Jesus? They won't follow after them. They'll lose their power. They'll lose their position. And so we already know that they're plotting to kill him. And so 
Mary anoints Jesus as an act of worship before he enters the city of Jerusalem and is hailed as the king of Israel. And not even the disciples fully realize until later that his kingdom is spiritual and not political. John confronts these post-temple Jews with this truth, that the Jewish leadership rejected Jesus, but they can become like Mary, his devoted followers. You see, the, the choice is ever before us and ever before them. John is writing to these people saying, look, the leadership rejected Jesus, but you have an opportunity to follow him now. You have an opportunity to honor the king, the one who ascended not the throne, but the cross. So often our expectation of Jesus is wrong. We expect him to give us happiness or to provide us with stuff. My, uh, my grandson has started, we started praying with him. And so I'll ask him sometimes, what do you want to pray for? Who do you want to pray for? And he prays mostly for people. But I'm pretty sure the day is coming where he's going to ask Jesus for a bicycle. That's Santa Claus. You see, Jesus is, can't, is coming for a different reason. Is it wrong? Now, on the day that he needs a bicycle, he'll be well taken care of. We want Christian values to reform our government. None of this is bad. We, it's not wrong to ask for stuff. It's not wrong to ask for good government. It's not even wrong to ask for Christian values in our government. But Jesus wants to turn our entire lives towards him. It's very personal. It starts with you. That everything that you are, that everything that you have, is at his disposal. Mary gets it. And then she honors the king by anointing his feet. The crowd seems to understand, but haven't we seen the crowd before? What do we know about the crowd? First they're one way, and then they're the other. And pretty soon it's going to be the other. Everyone knows that the cross is coming. And John explains the significance of Jesus in light of his rejection by the Jewish leadership. John wants his fellow Jews to know they can still follow Jesus. It's never too late to honor the king. And what's true for John's readers is true for you as well. You can honor the king. Now, I don't know what the nard is in your life. I, I don't know what it is that you regard as precious, whether it's a thing, something that you own, whether it's your time. Uh, that's probably my wife's biggest value, his biggest asset is her time. Sometimes I have to get on her schedule. Hey, can we have a conversation? Not today, maybe tomorrow. It's not that bad. Her time is one of the most valuable things to her. Her talent, your talent. I don't know what the nard is in your life. But Jesus wants you to offer it. And I'm not here to make you feel guilty about it. Whatever you have, you've earned as far as I'm concerned. But the Lord wants you to have it in your hands, open before him. To honor Jesus, the King. When Jesus entered Jerusalem on that donkey, people could smell the anointing he had received. And John has clearly laid out Jesus' identity as Messiah and King. He is worthy of our fullest devotion. The attitude of your heart and mind should be turned away from every distraction and focus on complete devotion to Jesus Christ. As the guys get ready for the offering, and as the worship team gets ready to come up, <clears throat> let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your son, Jesus. Lord, I ask that you look into my life, into the lives of my friends. And you, you let us know what it is that you expect of us. What it is that you want us to give to you. And Father, maybe it's not something that you have to point to. Maybe it's something we can just identify for ourselves. That in the worship and service of you as the King, Lord, let us lay before you everything that we are, everything that we have, whether it's status or position or power or resources, Father. They are all yours. They are at your disposal. Father, I pray for the life and the health of the church. I pray for the people who are struggling even now, Lord. People struggling with health. People struggling in their marriages, Father. I ask for your help, Lord. And I pray that as a community that follows you, Lord, that we would follow you earnestly and wholeheartedly, Father. That we would lay before you everything. That you would be glorified in Christ's name. Amen.
Father God, thank you so much for being a person that we can follow to build our lives up, to make you king in our lives. So grateful that you've done to save us. Thank you.